you open your Bibles to this spot as we work through God's word together. Jesus gives us these words as he's teaching his disciples. He says these, these words. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. A lot of times we stop at verse 13 and miss the significance of verses 14 and 15, where he says, if you forgive people when they sin against you, your Father will forgive you, but if you do not forgive them, your Father will not forgive you. And just a call to grace and mercy to the heart of the Father that he showed to us. We've been forgiven for everything, and we're called to also forgive others for what they've done to us. It's a good scripture. Let's pray together. So, Father, as we come this morning, I pray that for all of us, um, a better understanding of prayer and of how to be in relationship would be what comes out of this time and out of this word, your word. We pray that you would make clear to us your heart and what relationship with you um, can look like, what we're invited to participate in when it comes to knowing you and loving you and honoring you and walking with you. So Holy Spirit, may these words come alive for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I've used this phrase before, but I wanted to use it again for today, which is this, the battleground of our faith is the mind. Our battleground, the battleground of our faith is the mind. And if the enemy can poison our minds to reject God or the power of God or the truth of God, then he has won a great victory in us. And I think that the area of prayer for many believers, and not for our church, but for many believers, is really an area of struggle for many. Um, I have met many Christians who, if asked, do not want to pray in front of others. And the reason is more that they feel uncomfortable being asked to pray. They don't want others to hear them because they might embarrass themselves or they might get it wrong or, or they might not have... Um, an understanding that reflects well. And so many will just say, no, no, not me, someone else can pray. And I think that it's important for us um, to be equipped to pray in every circumstance, in every way. You know, and that's, and that's the point of, of the message that I wanted to get at today. Um, You know, someone once said, you know, do our prayers really matter? Because God really knows all things. Do our prayers really make a difference? If God's doing what he's going to do anyway, because he knows best, do our prayers actually matter? Has anyone ever heard that before? It's a common conversation that we have in Christianity. Because God's all-knowing and all-powerful and almighty, therefore he knows better anyway, so therefore should we pray? People ask. We had this debate especially when I was in seminary. And I think a great place to look when it comes to that question is Numbers 14, 12. Let's see if we have it up here, Joel. So let's go, we're go Numbers 14, 11 and 12. Let's go back to 11 here. This sets the stage for what is going on in Moses' life. The, now, the people of God 
when Moses went to, to Mount Sinai and made a golden calf and worshiped that as God. Okay, not cool in God's eyes to make a golden calf and worship that as God, okay? So when we see how big idolatry really is in terms of offense to God. And so God is so upset with the people making this golden calf and worshiping the golden calf as God that he says these words to Moses. He's, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs? Remember, he just took them out of Egypt. Like, within the past, you know, 12 months, he's taken them out of Egypt. He sent all the plagues. He had the Passover. And still, he says, in spite of all the miraculous signs, why do they, they will refuse to believe in me? Then verse 12. I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them. I will make you, Moses, into a nation greater and stronger than they. Who's excited about that verse? <laughs> the Lord is so upset that he says to Moses, I'm going to kill all these dumb, stubborn, hard-hearted people. Remember, Old Testament God, not New Testament. But Moses then pleads with God and says, No, Lord, you have brought them out of Egypt. You have done all of these Miracles, what will everyone think about them if they're killed in the desert? That's what he says. And he says, God, please save your people and show your glory through them. So, some of the listeners say, okay, God was testing Moses. Others just wanted to see, you know, where Moses was, because certainly he was upset as well. And then we come down to verse 20 of Numbers 14 where God says to Moses, I have forgiven them as you asked. Meaning that God actually changed, that Moses actually changed God's mind. And as we look at scripture in the Old Testament and even more so in the New, really what we have is a picture of divine partnership with God. That God actually honors the desires of our hearts, that, that, that what we care about, God cares about. And, and in prayer, we have relationship with him so that we can petition him for things and he can say, I've decided to do what you have asked. And does it matter if we pray for a person who is brokenhearted or a person who is broken-legged? Can we... Can we cause a difference? Can God move in their life through our prayers? The, the picture that we have in both the Old and the New Testament is yes. Can God replace that, that beloved, that, that hole that was created by someone that we cared about going away? When we ask God, the answer is yes. And many of us have testimony of these things. I never thought I'd find happiness again but God. You know, I never thought that, 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 that I would be able to get over this. And then God does something. And over and over again, God does the remarkable because he loves us and our prayers make a difference. And I really believe that. I think we need to carry that understanding of God and prayer in our hearts. I, I met with a, um, a young man this week who is planting a church in Los Angeles. He's a church planner. And he wanted to talk to me about, you know, our journey and what we're doing and, and where we're at now. And he asked me a, a question this week. Um, he said, what do you feel is at the heart of your ministry at, at SOPC? What do you think God's doing now? And we've talked about core values and certainly we've got our belief statement and our vision statement up on the website. And I talk about it on Sunday morning all the time. But I really felt, in light of, of where we've been and what's been going on, that we're called to be a place of, of authentic community. The people need community, real community, not, not the Hollywood community that likes you as long as you're successful and rich, but real authentic community that says, we meet you where you are, and we hold to God's truth and love you to see God do a better thing in your life, bring you out of the, the, the pit and into a, a better day, and we share life together. 
but that's that's the heart of church that we come and, and we share those things that are hard or even embarrassing or those areas that we feel alone in and we find connection and fellowship and hope and so that was the first part of it but the second part also was this that i felt that um part of our of our call as a church is to help people understand what relationship with jesus looks like and what life in the holy spirit is all about and so as i thought about this week and today i felt the lord pulling me back to prayer because it's in prayer that we commune with god it's one of the ways but a major way that we commune with god and we have here from Jesus in this passage of scripture a great model. Remember Jesus talked over and over again about how he was in the Father and the Father was in him, that God's words were his words and back and forth, but he only did what he saw the Father doing. It was all about relationship. And a big thing for us to start off with, let's, let's be in that passage there um, together. Let's, let's, let's look at that Matthew 6 passage. He starts off, um, by saying the word Father. He starts off by saying Father, our Father. Up till then, God was not referred to as Father. Remember Old Testament God? He was referred to as mighty one, powerful one, sometimes angry one, big scary one, live in the fear of the Lord one. And Jesus comes in and says, when we pray, God calls us to a point of relationship and intimacy where we say, Father. It was a new paradigm for relationship with God. Father. He even goes a step further in Mark 14, 36. Jesus, when he's um, at the doorstep for the crucifixion, he says these words, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. Abba meaning, it's a very affectionate term, literally in our language, meaning daddy. That kind of a closeness and a love and a passion. Daddy. To think of God the Father as Daddy. We see Paul emphasize this in Romans 8, 11 through 16, where Paul writes these words. And if the spirit of him who, was ra who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba. There it is again. Daddy, Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Abba. How many of you, when you pray, pray, Daddy? Daddy, I'm here. Daddy, I need you. Father, I want to understand what's going on in my life. Daddy, I want to reflect your love. Father, I want, to, I want to do your will. Daddy, help me to find hope in a place of struggle. These are very real prayers. You know, growing up, um, I felt like some of the people that I was with, they wanted to, to sound, you know, like very noble prayers. You ever, you know, seen this? Um, so we'd get down and they would say, you know, Oh, most magnificent, exalted, beautiful one. From whom the clouds are formed and the rain falls on the earth. And we'd go on for 20 minutes. There's nothing wrong with that. No, I mean, for some, that really does touch the heart, you know. 
But when we talk about prayer, really, I, I think at the heart of it is it's a connection for us with God. How do we relate to the God who made us, the God who loves us? And I think that the language really is a pretty common one. Like you would speak to somebody that you love. You know, it says in the scripture at the very beginning of Matthew 6, we looked at here, um, he says, when you pray, not of hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. And I've got some that say, you know, well, I'm not a good prayer, so don't ask me to pray. I think we're all good prayers. It's not a real word, but for the message it matters. We all have been equipped and we all have what is necessary to pray to God, to hear his voice and to be in relationship with him. There's a, a story that I, that I heard a while back about a pastor who talked about he used to go every year to a youth group and one year he went there and um, there was another pastor who at, uh, at six o'clock in the morning on Sharp would go down to the prayer chapel and would be praying and he would wake up the whole camp with his loud exaltations. And everyone in the camp would say, wow, that pastor so-and-so, he's really a spiritual guy. Isn't he great? Isn't he holy? And we're told that our relationship with God is to focus on him, not on what others think about what we're saying. Our goal should be relationship with him, him hearing our voice, him knowing our hearts, and us knowing his. I think it's important when we pray that we hold to the core truths that we have in Scripture. Here's some core truths. The first one is that we know that we are important to God as his sons and daughters. Our identity to God is not slave or servant or worm in the dirt. It is son or daughter because of Christ. So we haven't actually earned son or daughtership, but we've, but we've been given that position in Jesus the moment that we said yes. And we can't lose that. You know, we don't come in and say, oh, Lord, I went to Vegas this weekend. Now I'm back to being a worm. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Not that we should go wildly sinning because we're not going to be a worm again. The morality and righteousness that we live out in our lives comes from that relationship and that daughtership or that sonship that we have with God. He says for us in 1 John 3, 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. So when we pray, we need to know our identity, our position with God. That when we come to him, he listens to us like the perfect and loving father. Not a bad father, an abusive father, or an absent father. He's none of those things. And as some of us have those models, and and we're encouraged to not put that on God because that's not who God is. He's the perfect, loving, ever-present Father who loves to be with his children. Remember that God loves us as a perfect Father, and in all things, his desire is to reconcile, to draw us back to himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 says this. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he committed to us the message of reconciliation. God's heart is that we would be drawn back to personal, close intimacy with him in all things. And we're reminded that in all things, God is at work for the good of those who have chosen Jesus. This is a really big deal when it comes to prayer. Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. 
So when we come to God in prayer, we need to hold these truths. Because if we don't have them, we can come in the wrong mindset or with the wrong understanding. Uh, some folks come to me and they say, God just doesn't hear what I'm praying. That's not true. We don't know what his time frame is, but all these scriptures are God's promises and truth, and that is our position. That is our identity, and that is who he is. And so when we come in prayer, we have this great truth that we step into that relationship with. When I, when I speak with, with my wife, there's an understood relationship there that is very different from when I speak with Anybody else? That relationship determines how we communicate. It determines how we know the one with whom we are communicating. I think it makes all the difference. And we're called to pray certain important things, like the verse we have in, in 610, which you guys have heard me quote a lot. We pray things like, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we're actually invited to bring God's world here into ours. That we're called to participate in bringing God's world into ours because that's what Christ modeled for us. He brought the kingdom here on earth. That's a huge truth. For us in our faith that we're called to bring the kingdom here on earth how we interact with others how we share the message how we pray with others the way in which we carry ourselves the way in which we are abundant in forgiveness and mercy and love and uncompromising in truth but doing it in a way that is right So I want to encourage you as you go home um, to think about how you pray and be equipped in praying God's truth in your own life. A great way to start is to look at scripture and actually pray that over yourself. That might sound funny, but it's really powerful. So I would encourage you to go and find scripture that you know is powerful and just read through it and highlight certain things and write them down on, on, on three by five cards. I mean, uh, one of the ones that I really appreciate is this where I'm at right now in my place in life is Acts chapter 4, 29 through 31. And we see where, where Peter and John, um, they, they prayed for a man who was sick. He was radically healed. And the Sanhedrin grabs him and beats him and says, you talk about Jesus anymore, we're going to put you in jail and kill you. Okay? They just told him that. And now this is what Peter and John pray. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Spread out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. In verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And, and this is one example of, of how my prayer life has changed. Usually there's times that were very hard or painful. I would say, oh, Lord, please take away the pain. Now, if we're standing in what's right, we say, God, give me more boldness. A different approach. Let me be more like you, Lord, and like your followers. We speak these things over ourselves and over those that we love. And prayer, again, like I said, is very conversational. And, and I hope that through all these things that we can all feel equipped to pray publicly and privately in a way that really connects with the heart of God. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that when Jesus was crucified, that curtain in the temple court was torn in two, which signified that we no longer needed an intermediary to talk with you like we did in the Old Testament times. And as we understand more and more and better and better what it means, what it looks like to be in relationship with you, to talk with you, to trust you, to discover the more and the greater things, I pray that you would show us that our prayer lives would 
grow in abundance. That our relationship with you would go deeper and be more intimate, more fulfilling, and more foundational in our lives than they ever have been before. And with grateful hearts, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.